narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. I'm joined this evening by Adam Camilleri. Evening, everybody. New 40k. Brand new 40k. Brand new everything. Except it's kind of not brand new. See, like, okay. It, it is, It is, but it isn't, you know? They're saying it, right? They're saying it's, it's not completely brand new. And I believe them. Like, we're going to have the same familiar mechanics of rolling dice, setting up terrain, making army list. <laughs> <laughs> spending command points but for everything that i get sorry i know i jump right into it we are the bell lost halls podcast uh, on this episode we're going to have several uh, segments that we insert uh, get some people's takes some people from the community that you you probably know get their take on what's happening with ninth edition where we're 40,000 ninth edition mm. and so i paul adam and i are going to cover a little bit of as well and i apologize if it if it if we covered again in those segments but it's going to be with the with the fresh eyes and ears of those folks we have joining us so thanks for sticking in with us so if i was to make an analogy about what's what i feel is the changes at the moment it seems like the core rules are going to stay ex- pretty virtually the same there might, might be some little tweaks here and there like i know there were some differences that uh, have been noted in the the morale phase and with the how terrain interactions and stuff, but it sounds like the depth stuff, the all the, the stuff that you happens between you and your opponent, e.g., like uh, terrain, like modifiers, like the the things that that you bring that changes the way your opponent plays, and the stuff that he brings that changes the way you play. That stuff's going to change. The interactive stuff, the the basic stuff that everybody walks up to the game with, but e.g., being the rule set and like the the codex and stuff, that doesn't seem like it's going to change in the near future at least i mean the codex as they've said is going to get updates at some point they even went further to say that um they're going to be updated with some of the some of the bits from psychic awakening but not all the bits from psychic awakening is that true well I, what i got from it is that psychic awakening will be valid until a new codex replaces like say for instance i mean they specifically called out the blood angels so you know i started listening <laughs> if, if you just i can just imagine you perking up it's so funny. There was a comment someone recently left. Is like somehow they always manage to talk about blood angels, no matter what the show's about. Like, eh, you know, listen. Yeah, it's a talent. It's a skill. What are you talking about? <laughs> but <laughs> uh, the, the, this time, the, you know, Stu Black specifically pointed this out. He said that when, for instance, it, when and if the Blood Angels Codex gets updated, it will bring forward with them the, you know, the the good parts, the the parts they want to keep or that are relevant from Psychic Awakening, and then you would, you know, that would replace those books at the time, the same way we get codexes and stuff now. Yeah, and look, that makes a lot of sense. The rolling over, the rolling over of rules is something that we all want. We all want amalgamation of rules and things. And look, it's it's okay to leave some stuff behind as long as it's it's not losing the flavor that that book brought in the first place. Well, at the in the last transition from seventh to eighth, you know, there are some people that felt a little salty after they had just purchased their books. Hey, look, I'm sympathizing. I'm right there with they just purchased their their campaign books, and mm. the edition changed changed, and then basically invalidated them. You know, that's a yeah. learning point. Of course, I mean. Yep. Yes, there was at some point it was going to happen to where your books were valid and then they were not valid. And that something like that's going to keep happening, right? Yeah, I, it, it, to some extent it has to. With the with the rapid rules release and the way that g is obviously wanting to structure and grow the game, there is, there's always going to be a little bit of a burn factor. But um, it seems like this time they've at least tip of the hat, nod, hey – we realize we've been putting out a lot of stuff. Everyone's got armies they're they're happy with. Mm. You know, we're we're going to make sure that the rules function with the rules that you have, your army rules that you have currently. That does not say yeah. nothing new's going to come out. Just that you know, when the edition hits, you'll be able to play with what you have and the text mm. that you have. So, so I was I was also so I've, I've I wasn't awake, guys. It was like three o'clock in the morning for me when this thing happened so i was obviously asleep and uh, um someone told me that they said they were going to be keeping the vigilist books uh yes so formations and the stuff in the vigilist like that all stays i mean that, that's the again this is this is was slightly informal on the stream but mm-hmm. yes it seemed like everything was going everything every book wise everything that you may have an army built already for you'll be able to play with on day one now, see that one. The vigilist one is the one I expect to get cut. If I expect, if I thought any any book was going to get cut in this transition, I thought it was going to be the vigilist ones. Because I, uh, this is my this is my gut feeling, purely my gut feeling. I feel like the vigilist books was an experiment that they thought might be good, but but, but failed. Oh, you, okay. Now I, f- I feel like it's something they tried to do. They realized it wasn't going to be what they wanted it to do, and uh, they put a plug in it because we haven't seen anything of the ilk of Vigilus in the last what eight months since, Hang since with the me. Vigilance to Flight came out. You go. What What if we're going to see more formations as we move into ninth? 
that was that was my next point. Does that mean that that that, <laughs> that system that they're they're building actually had some longevity? And my gut feel is wrong. Well, that they actually say, hey, we're going to back this to a little bit more. We're just waiting for the next uh, big plot point campaign thing to come out, which could be this. I've been joking that this is Soul Wars 2.0, <laughs> the whole <laughs> Imperium versus Necrons thing. It is a bit tongue in cheek, but it is still a bit Soul Wars, isn't it? But um. So it, it could be, it could be we start getting uh, some more Necrons. Maybe we get some sister specialist attachments, Necron specialist attachments. Well, uh, you, hopefully, what, hopefully not a whole new slew of Primaris Marine ones because that would just be erroneous. But what, what we've seen from the, everything that's been said so far is that we're all going to start with the same amount of command points. And, and there's been some comments of people they think that that's not a great thing. I, I'd, you know, but I think it's you're incredible. Not, you're not going to please everybody, right? But uh, I, yeah, but the the. The other thing past that is you're going to be able to trade some of those, oh, you know, those awarded CP for uh, different benefits in the game, mm-hmm. and that could be that could be a detachment, that could be a, a bringing in an ally, that could be a formation. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that the possibilities are endless with it. I think it's a fantastic system. I'm a big fan, and in fact, I I been out there as touting saying that these are one of the options that could go down even like two years ago saying oh command points doesn't work as well as i think it could maybe there's something they could do instead because you think about it like this yeah all the armies that don't have soup options that don't don't even have soup options we're talking with tower talking crons we're talking orcs um they just get an ex- exponentially more cp and they can then now they can just build whatever armies they want they your orcs and you don't have to have three battalions you can have your command, a super, you have supreme commands. You can have one brigade. You can have whatever, the, whatever the hell you want. You, but you're still going to have this huge pool of command points, which your army relies on. You can have all um, those sweet buggies. Yeah, you're just getting given more. Um, and I love that. I love that a lot because it used to be like, oh, an orc army can, can't doesn't have the option for allies, and because of their reliance on CP, you have to buy a crap load of stuff. You have to buy so many Gretchen, so many boys, so many HQ choices, weird boys, and I mean, it, it just so happens that those are actually pretty good in game. But that's beside the point. Your your, your hand is forced. Um, Whereas now you, the, the army list making freedom that these monofaction books will have, I think, will be at very exciting times for them. Yeah, I think so too. I've I've never to this day seen a uh, what is it, a rucka truck squig buggy on the table. I know, you, you you could say any two combination of words to me right now, and I'd say yeah, that's probably a buggy. <laughs> I don't. I only know like the scrap jet, um, and the one with the KFF on it. The, I mean, so those are KFF, amazing. The, SA, the SAG. It's, it's an amazing model, <laughs> and I've. I mean, I haven't even seen pictures of them online, you know, of people putting them together. And mm-hmm. and I think that that's largely because you just can't fit them in, like to, to yeah. play with them and in in hope to have some type of outcome, you know, victorious outcome. You really can't fit them in. And part of that is a, a consideration of how many CP you need. And, and maybe, you know, just maybe uh, that this will get more flavorful armies. I mean, there are... Exactly. There are things yep. that people like. They just take the considerations piece. Like I've got to take this. Yeah, I want to do this one effect, but I can only do it one time on the table in one place because mm-hmm. I only have eleven models from that faction on the table because I had to get everything else. Exactly right. Well, you think so. Uh, Orcs is still going to be the, my best example of this because the because of the way that Tower and Necron lists are kind of currently being built at the moment, they're a bit wonkier to talk about. Orcs, yeah. If you're an orc player who never wanted to build, um, you never wanted to do your 280 whatever orc boys, you can just run 90 orc boys and have the same CP as the guy who runs 280 orc boys, and then you fill out the rest with the uh, killer cans, you know, <laughs> just for the for the last because you're a, you're a mad dog, <laughs> and you're bung wagon snaz bits. Well, okay, <laughs> so bone wagon snaz bits and and, uh, and mech and you know, all that kind of stuff like those have also been slightly hamstrung by the the terrain rules and you know it was explicitly stated in this uh, q and a session that that would going to be reworked so things like monsters and titanic things are not just limited to assaulting things on the bottom floor yeah or within an i found that so something. funny you've you've got this like skyscraper tall like imperium knight and he can only attack the guys that are next to his toe you know well it's funny i I thought that was hilarious that that interaction that stratagem in the night book that allowed them to attack the second floor of a building or whatever Mm -hmm. you could tell that that at least to me that felt like they had to put that in there because the game the system became like a victim of itself yeah well well everyone was just like okay well i'll just stay 
uh, 1.1 inches away from the walls and knights can't actually interact with me, especially when all the new, well, the ITC terrain rules came out where it's line of sight blocking. So if you, you just, you're standing right, literally right next to a knight, like 1.1 inches away, he knows you're there, you know he's there, he can't do anything about you. That's just funny. <laughs> But this is coming at it with this approach, and this is an interesting thing. So, in and I saw this conversation come up on Twitter, to where someone yep. was was stating that anybody who believed that the that the eighth edition rules said specifically catered to match play players was probably in, you know was on the wrong track because this game was to be was designed to be ex- as accessible as it can it to was, as many yeah. people as possible. Yeah, and, I agree and, with that. I think there was the the broadest brush taken to it to give it the, the widest appeal possible. And, you know, and I think with a little bit of a trim down rule set and some, I don't want to say loosey goosey, but like optional terrain rules, uh, we, we came up with this, you know, the, the way the game actually interacted, the way it played out had this mm-hmm. kind of like, to your point earlier, some kind of weird interactions. And if they've taken the, uh, the tack to kind of smooth that out and make it even more accessible to more mm-hmm. players. And I don't even say casual players, just more players, then that's that's a, a net benefit to us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. To um, us competitive players is what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well I think I think to all players. I think yeah. uh, adding adding depth and layers that people can go to or step back from at will, um, from game to game, tournament to tournament, if that's what they that, that, that's what they please, I think it's only a good thing. So I'm I'm very much a variety is the spice of life when it comes to my hobby. What do you think needs to remain to keep our competitive interest dialed in? It, assuming anything's going to come out, like we don't know, we don't know nothing about it. But if if things change, what do you think has to remain for us to be engaged at that level? Mm, that's a good one. That's actually a really good question. So I, I think, like, so the rapid molding of the meta has created this kind of um, momentum for competitive gamers that we can attach ourselves to. That's always interesting. It's always developing. It's always evolving. Um, and that's, that's of course, fueled by G-dubs, you know, ridiculously, like, enormous volume break of breakneck break break speed of rules and models releases, which is phenomenal. Like, Keep it coming. I've never, seen, I've never seen anything like it. But um, for a competitive player, it's very exciting. I mean, it does it, – it, I, could, I could tell you at times trying to keep up with rules gets absolutely overwhelming and exhausting. But at the same time, it's invigorating. It's exciting thinking that I can play I can play a list or I can have an army that has been you know out of vogue for three months and all of a sudden it gets a whole new coat of paint and holy crap, baby, it operates in a whole new brand new exciting ways. That is just well. Think about Grey Knight players. Yeah, I know. I, I'm I'm going to have a little bit of a poke at a, a good portion of Grey Knight players, but you know, you guys weren't playing Grey Knights before Psychic Awakening. Please don't tell me you were like oh, some folks were. Knight player. Some I was were. I was playing it even when they weren't good. No, you weren't. There was like four dudes, and I can name all of them. <laughs> That's it. But uh, uh, joking. People love Grey Knights. Grey Knights is one of the most popular, thematic, and exciting Space Marine factions, and they were a shelf sitter essentially almost straight out of the gate. We got the Grey Green Knights Codex came out, and everyone's like, oh, uh, I guess this is okay. And then you got like Imperial Guard and Chaos Space Marines and all that stuff. And you're like, oh, no, this isn't okay. <laughs> this doesn't measure up in any way. Um, <laughs> and look at them now. They are curb stompers. Um, well, and they feel like Grey Knights again. Well, and um, I got the impression, you know, that Grey Knight troops are the weakest thing in the army. Uh, yes. One wound awkwardly pointed because of all their abilities like yes the points are worth it for for a model that does what it does but then when it interacts the same way with a las rifle as a guy who's three points less which is 20 yeah. percent less or whatever it becomes kind of weird right but now you might not have to take those anymore and you still get the name same number of cp as everybody else still get the same number of cp was, that was actually my segue you know those double uh this is actually a bit scary to me you know people are the, the i guess the competitive um top tier gray knight list at the moment is two battalions two units of paladins you could just take three units of paladins to get the same cp now yes yeah all that's terminators uh i mean that's yeah that's actually kind of terrifying <laughs> I mean, a Grey Knight yeah. army with 50, 60 Terminators on the table. Mm, I mean, I love the idea of that. I think that's fantastic. I don't know how many points that is, but it feels like around 2,000. Probably all of them, yeah. <laughs> Probably all the points. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the same time, like I can make a Deathwing army for Dark Angels. That's going to have the same amount as a Green Wing, same amount of CP as a Green Wing army, as a Raven Wing army, as all those things. But I think that's both good and bad, because I think there's enough uh, variance inherently in how books are built and how codexes are flavored, that having more or less CP doesn't won't really add or detract that much from how things operate. Um, it just means you'll be added 
take the toys that you want and make them do the same amount of stuff that other people do. Might not be enough. Like, I mean, I, I can. I, Blood Angels is a good example. Ha, we always seem to manage to talk about Blood Angels. It's correct. <laughs> oh, wait, um, twist my arm. The C, like the this, they're, they're so CP thirsty. They're one of the C, most CP thirsty. Like, um, the more you, more CP you pay, the more crazy your army becomes. Like there, there, like someone, the someone, someone put out, a, someone put out a graph for me showing the CP expenditure to CP explosive to power. Take, CP let, to crazy, yeah, yeah. Let, let's and, um, take Blood Angels to be at the top of that list. Let's take a quick break because we're t- we're touching on something that that Stephen and I talk about in the next segment. So I want to hear his take on it, uh, and then we'll come back. And I got some things that may blow your mind. Blow it. See you in a minute. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey everybody, welcome to a Community Spotlight segment on Forge the Narrative. This is, we're ramping up to Warhammer 40,000 9th edition. I want to bring on folks from around the community that I know are, are very much excited about what's coming out. And today I'm joined by Mr. Stephen Box. How you doing, Paul? Thanks for having me on again. Yo, man, welcome. No, it was a it was a pleasure to have you on my show. So um, my my listeners loved it. So thanks so much for coming on to mine as well. It was a we had a really good sit and chat. So uh, yeah, I'm so so excited about ninth edition going forward. Yeah. So uh, you know we're off. We're recording this right after the the studio Q and A that they did on Tuesday afternoon my time. And a lot of cool things to get discussed. Is there anything particular that that caught your ear and that you think is a big improvement to the game? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to read between the lines. <laughs> what was, I was trying to pick up on what they weren't saying, you know. Um, and for me, obviously, I take a real like, um, obviously, I'm all about, you know, playing the game in any way that brings you happiness. You know, I'm all about that. But for me, what brings me happiness is more of a competitive side of the game, that strategic high level thinking, the strategy. So what I really loved is that they've reached out to competitive events and they've took the opinions of people like Mike Brandt, people like that, to really help shape the way that we play competitive um, and also help reduce the amount of gamey, or they call it like gamey aspects, you know. So um, think things like where you've got situations where you've got a guy who's on a level above a Carnifex and the Carnifex is just looking at him, <laughs> licking his lips and can't actually uh, get there. So I think if they're removing all those like weird bits where you've got like unchargeable units and stuff i think it's going to be a really slick clean addition so very excited about that that was the first impressions anyway yeah see you, there's been a lot of talk about how uh some people believe that this previous edition catered to more of the competitive player and, or let me say a tournament based player i think we're all in the heart when we sit down to want to play a game we're all going to have that kind of desire to to win that game, have a favorable outcome for us. Yeah. But a thought that this might be too focused on, or the perception that may be focused on more of a tournament based game. And I don't think that's the case. I think that we've been more of an, in a casual play and that's going to, we're going to continue or casual way to approach the game if that's what you wanted to do. And I think we're on a trajectory to still do that, but with a little bit of that, like you were just talking about rough edges smoothed off. Yeah, and in, in that will actually help the transition between when you've got somebody that is a more potentially competitive minded player and somebody that potentially plays a, a higher percentage of more narrative games with their friends. When they when these two individuals do meet at a club, uh, whether it's a local gaming store or an independent whatever, may, maybe a little local tournament, then actually the bridge between the two, the gap is no longer as vast. It's not, ah, oh, gotcha, or, ha, you didn't know that, or whatever. It's a case of, okay, yeah, we're playing the same game here, um, and that transition, and that's what, you know, my whole channel's all, all about, is help people with that transition from who are new to the hobby to getting to their first ever tournament or something. So I'm I'm looking at it from a pers- perspective here where, yeah, we're going to see some fantastic elements with this crusade they, they're talking about where, you know, you can build your own crusade. Um, and it sounds kind of like if, if, if I went to a local gaming store and played a game, I could add crusade points or buffs and abilities to my army. And then I went up and played my mate Joe. We would get some benefits as well. So that's really cool for that side of things. But I think 
hopefully that transition is going to be seamless into the tournament as people upskill or as people become more competitively focused potentially um and those two things aren't mutually exclusive but um yeah hopefully that transition is really nice and clean Man, do you, would you agree see, or do you have a sort of I, different opinion on that no i do agree we might even see tournaments that incorporate some of the crusade over the the course of the three games or five games or whatever i mean i I don't think that we can limit ourselves to what we're thinking about right now. What what I enjoyed here, the thing that stuck about for me is is bringing back an abstract nature to terrain, where things you know you they may have a, a keyword or whatever, such as obscure or something. I mean, I'm trying to think about what well, you know what we just heard, and and that was going to lend itself to being a little bit easier to it, it's a pass fail. Do, does this obscure or not? Do I get the rule? For, benefit from that or not and we're not down there measuring down to the micron or feeling like we're not uh, involved in the game with our things like big things like vehicles yeah or if you can't you know you got to, you know ask someone from another table oh can you see if i can see this guy who's poking his sword out behind you know um i don't know like maybe there's the uh two little gaps in a actually the glue didn't set properly you know and then yeah i can see you through that gap or whatever so i'm, I'm really looking forward to that that is the um, worst or, we've all been you know, there you're, <laughs> yeah or you know like where a wood you, 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 it's not just on the table and you're like oh, what is the point in that you know now it's like well maybe if you're completely behind the wood maybe it blocks line of sight Man, I'm looking for it. Used to be where if you were if you measured two inches deep, if you were two inches deep into a wood, then you couldn't be seen. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it, and, that that's, what it, maybe that's too too far. You know, when you're down there measuring, am I two, am I two and a quarter or whatever? I don't know. You know, but I'm saying that's the way well, we to have that kind of stuff. We do that with objectives, right? You know, and I think as long as like uh, the wood has, if you look at like the GW woods and things, they are they do come on a little base, don't they? So it would be easy to say. And again, if you're playing, I'm two inches inside this this wood, by the way. Um, you know, when you can declare your intent, you know, when you're playing, that would speed things up. So um, I'm really looking forward to that as well. And I think what also sounds great is that there's going to be different benefits. So it could be that the wood maybe might also be a, or it could rather than be a cover save, it could be a minus one to hit now we don't know how oh, things point. are going to change or some some ruins could be plus two to your cover save in in whether something else like a hill might be a plus one or uh, maybe if you're on a hill you get an extra six inch range or something so there could be yeah, like high ground some you, sort just, you just always win yeah because otherwise <laughs> what is the point of being on a hill apart from it takes me ages to get up there and ages back down it's kind of a bit of a um at the moment the hills don't really function in the game so it'd be cool to actually have elevation i don't know tactics or strategies right so yeah i mean we're, 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 we're slightly wish listing we're slightly speculating you know based off of the imperfect information that we've you know kind of been fed over the last couple of days or so and a lot of people are just clamoring yo give me the edition right now yeah i kind of like the hype yeah. though i kind of like the build up yeah no yeah, me too. It's like a, um, for a content creator, I'm like, right, what can I do today? What can I be talking about? And, you know, I've been already straight away as soon as that me and all my mates were on Discord, we're chatting about what we think, um, like some huge changes coming in where they dropped in that you can always hit on a six now. So that's going to be a big change to the addition. That is, you know, it didn't it didn't come up incredibly often, at least not for me, but it created sometimes it created just these weird, awkward situations. Yeah, when you've got like an Alatoc flyer with or a Alatoc unit that's like shadow specters and they got conceal on them, the lightning fasted, they did this and that and the other, and all of a sudden you're hitting them on tens. You're like, okay, well I can't even shoot that, and then the unit behind that can't be shot. So it it, uh, it will I think dramatically affect certain builds um, because they've they've also said that they're gonna cap the minus um, modifiers now, are capped at a minus one or a plus one. That's strong. That's gonna be real easy to to track. Yeah, but it does mean we're going to see a, a big shake up in the meta, like the possessed bomb now, which works off being, you know, like minus one from a priest, minus one through Alpha Legion, minus one through Miasma of Pestilence, and then a concealed stratagem. So the possessed unit behind that possessed unit can't be shot. It, it's going to really shake it up. So we're going to see some different builds rather than. Oh, I've got nine planes that are all a latox. So I think it's going to be quite nice. Where um, that's really going to be exciting. Where we, we it's a it's literally like we're going into a whole new phase of the game. And what was good might not be good going into this new one. Well, as a list builder and, and innovator, this is the things that get me most excited. You know, it's like what what can how can I look at this rule set now and then you know make some really crunchy gnarly builds. 
Yeah. Is there, is there anything for you, Paul, that you thought oh, this really came out of? I wasn't expecting that from what they've said. Um, not not so far. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say I wasn't expecting it. Uh, there were some things that did excite me, though, in the stuff like with the plus ones that, and that you're talking about. And then I, did, I have been excited about the Crusade stuff. I mean, that's that's one of the things that a lot of people have been messaging me about is is their enthusiasm for the cr- Crusade part of this game. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to see how all that plays out. Uh, I was interested to see about how the monsters work. The monsters are going to work in a way that interacts, seem to... Uh, more fluidly with the game. Yeah. And right now we just don't see a lot of that stuff on the table. So in my competitive world, there have been things that have been just long absent from the tabletop. Yeah. And no, I, I think that this, uh, with this shake up in the rules, that the intent will be to bring some of that back. Now, look, we still don't know if that's not going to be, if that's going to be the case. Like there will be things that emerge to the top as being, you know, strong things to take. And, you know, the rules are big, rules and points and missions are all play into that. But I think at least what I'm getting is that the philosophy is that there's a desire to bring some of those things back to the table and have them play in a way that is pleasing. Yeah. From the, the, the sort of ethos I, get, I gathered from the video, it's all about helping you take the models that you want to take. And with that means you're not forced to take other things you don't. And if you do, then you pay the resources for them. Potentially, like with, you know, is soup still on the menu? That the, the question's still out there now, or you've got to pay the resources for it. Is that is that trade-off worth it potentially? We'll find out. Um, and like you said, like we, we kind of want all units to fit and have a place in the game, right? Rather than okay, well, this unit just never sees play because it, that could be your favorite model or whatever it might be. So I think that's going to be great where we see these huge monsters again. You know, I'm thinking Nids or... Um, yeah. Yeah, When's the last time you've seen a, a Carnifex? Or I can't even remember the name of what like, the big bug is that, that tunnels in from the below or it's kind of it's a dual kit. Like when's, yeah. when's the last time um, you've seen that thing? Um, uh, yeah, literally. I wouldn't even know. Um, yeah, I'll can, send you one high five if you can even tell me the name. One internet high five if you tell me the name of that thing. Yeah, I'm, 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 I want an internet high five now, Paul, and I can't even think. <laughs> Tyragon, something like that's that. That's something like that. Tyranifex, Tur- you know. Turbagon. Um, Turbagon, that's it. Is, I don't know, who knows. But um, yeah, that's it. exactly. That's the one. So it'd be great to see some of that stuff. Or like, um, in what they've said about how Blast um blast is going to work now and they did mention about taking out some of the randomness of you know like the dreaded d6 weapon there's nothing worse when you've got that battle cannon and you need it to do work for you and you just roll that one and you're just like oh wow what on tank commander um there's been a lot of talk about that people are, are voicing their thoughts of like how weird it's been this entire time to roll d6 shots for a battle cannon trying to assume that you know once you roll the shots and then you have to hit are you really firing one slug out of this thing or you know it's just a difficult thing and you know, look, I don't even know if that's going away, but it, we got a clear impression that it's at least going to behave uh, in a way you think it should when you're dealing with large numbers of units in, or large numbers of models in a unit. Yeah. Can I can I hypothesize a little bit? Yeah. So um, what? So again, reading between the lines, it was all about taking that randomness out. So when you are facing big units like Horde, they did say that you're going to get some benefits. So we could look at some of the other things that have been happening in the game, which might sort of... Um, you know, they may have borrowed those sort of synergies or um, not synergies, but sort of mechanics. So it could be, you know, how Crimson Fist get a plus one to hit if they're shooting over so many models. Mm-hmm. Could get a plus one to your hit. It could be uh, like a Catachan re-roll. It could be roll two dice, pick the highest. It could be um, or what could happen is even minimum three shots like we've seen with minimum three damage from the repulsor um so instead of the damage it could be the amount of shots so that would be quite good because if you've got that battle cannon yeah it's d6 but when you're fighting like 30 orcs yeah maybe it's just minimum flat flat three so you can sort of know a little bit what you're going to leverage out of that unit um that, that you know so there's different ways they could go with that and either of those or any of those sounds good to be honest it's all a buff for those units yeah it's an interesting um, thought for for sure i mean this is you know, breathing life back into you know into the game. I mean, this has been a, we have a thriving community, right? So that I mean people are playing, but you know we have kind of gotten it boiled down to we know what the what the great stuff is. You know, this is really going to shake it up. You know, we even saw some of those those previews from the the machine war. You know, the psychic awakening stuff that that's coming out. Yeah, sorry, engine war, and we're 
that's going to be carried forward. So we're not losing any of the stuff that we've got uh, right now, which is kind of another interesting thing, a lesson learned from moving from seventh to eighth. Yeah, no, I'm really, really excited. And the way that they've described command points is going to be interesting um, that everyone starts with the same now. So there's like a level playing field. What do you think about that? Because this has been, I posted the summary uh, from the, the Q&A on the Forge the Narrative Facebook page. And one of the first comments was they think that giving everybody the same amount of command points is bad. Um, I think it will be, is it bad? There are certainly some armies that do require more than others. Um, and there was an element of list building tactics where you thought, okay, well, I need this many CP, so I'm going to have to take the the hit on if i want this to function like that it's kind of like the the checks and balances right if you want all this good stuff then you've got to take that um and if you're not too fussed about that well actually you've got different options at your disposable which was the tactics in the list building phase i did like but no doubt no in gw there's plenty of other different list building tactics that we're going to be talking about in six months like <laughs> well this is even better sort six of tactics two months three months yeah so um absolutely so the thing which I'm going to find really interesting is the role of detachments. And are we going to see more formations? You know, maybe is it like you spend a CP and you get this? I don't know. Like you, you've seen what we've seen with like Vigilus or whatever it might be. So you unlock new stuff. You get a different keyword because otherwise detachments, what what what's their role in the game? It sounds like they still have a role. Um, and if they weren't in the game, then they then all of a sudden the books like Vigilus of Detachment, and, uh, Vigilus Defiant and Vigilus of Blaze you may as well, you know, chuck them in the bin. But the the guys on GW did say you can still use them, which means detachments are still in to some degree. So, in what degree though is yet to be deciphered. But um, uh, no, I like it. The only my worry is, are we still going to see troops? You know, are we? Are they going to make troops cheaper? So, well, okay. is your can I can jump in here yeah, for a second? Please like, do it. All troops are not created equal. So who cares if you see some troops in certain armies? Troops are a function. Troops were a mechanism to get me to a four sword chart, to get me to a detachment for CPs. Now, I mean, do you really mind? I mean, do you in your heart of heart mind if you don't see troops? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know how I feel about that, Paul. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, a, it's a question, right? <laughs> I mean, I... Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, what what's a Blood Angel army without at least, you know, three units of the scouts? I mean, woof. Better. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm slightly kidding. I, I do know exactly what you're talking about. Like some of the, like for instance, for instance, like a Katachin brigade. You know, there's you you get that's exactly what that army is about, and you see it with all the troops. And if that, if if those core character, uh, you know, figures disappear, then are you playing that same thing? And you know, maybe. Yeah, I mean it's. The, 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 I think I feel that GW they've probably got some things up their sleeve they're not telling us so I'm sure there's some sort of like extra buffs or because just getting a you know objective secured isn't going to be good enough so I really hope there's like extra oomph in there that the troops give you um, because you know your army is a that what you know over the last sort of few months they've really rewarded you if you've gone mono faction if you built your army in a certain way you've got more and more good things because it's become more thematic and probably more like like a bit of nostalgia right when you see those like you said those guardsmen or those tactical squad guys they're the they're like the bread and butter aren't they of your list so i still really hope they've got some sort of play but maybe more tactic you know maybe they've got more of a strategic role rather than just i'm gonna hide these at the back so i don't give away a kill point yeah well i mean with with missions is you know, you know we, we know missions are going to change and and one of the main things about missions you know you, you dice it up uh, am i removing models am i standing in a certain place am i on a fixed point or am i in a quadrant or something there's only so many different ways you, you can dice this this kind of stuff up and if troops hold that uh, you know that domination effect where if i you know like say for instance table quarters if that is an objective i can just spitball in here if in in one troop choice invalidates no matter how many other other things you have they there becomes instant value in them yeah no that's true yeah because we've seen missions in the past where you have to be within a certain radius of the circle and how many models you had in that circle counted is i mean i'll be honest i hated that mission personally but it was there <laughs> right so we, we never know what um what may come up so yeah i mean it's all uh yeah I, i'm i'm literally like 
we're obviously kind of spitballing some different ideas and take probably what we've said with a bit of a punch of salt, right? Well, because it could, a whole, it could go whole any way, right? I mean, you're right though. Like, what, but there, there's always been maybe if if I'm paraphrasing or let me know, but there's always been a risk versus reward of whether or not you took a basic troop or yeah. where you, whether you went to more elite or, you know, heavy type stuff. And I, and I'm, I mean, elite in like the, the sense of a more premium troop or, yeah. or tr- pr- premium army option. But, you know, one of the things that's, it's always been kind of a difficult thing for Warhammer to wrestle with is that the core of every army is no longer created equal. They're uh, 20 points of Marines is not equal to 20 points of Eldar guardians yeah. anymore. And, and so it's always been this kind of weird trade off with troops. And maybe if, you know, we completely unshackle ourselves from them, we might, I mean, I don't know what that means. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm right, I'm right there with you. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's a, it's a funny one, isn't it really? Cause <laughs> it's like the troops in the in a way are like your, um, at the moment, they're kind of like the tax, aren't they? Like the here's the stuff I've kind of got to take just my army to function, but um, it, which is you know representative in you know kind of modern warfare, I suppose. You've got your bog standard infantry that kind of go out, they do the job, they've got the most basic weapons, but there's lots and lots of them. Um, and then you've got the commanders leading the way, and then obviously you've only got limited resources in terms of like finances to you know how many tanks can you take to the battlefield or whatever. So. Um, I don't know. It's going to be it's, honestly, Paul. It's a, it's an interesting one, um, and I, I, I sometimes I don't feel sorry for. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, like I, I feel sorry sometimes for the GW rules writers because they must have a right headache a lot of the time, and especially with the amount of, um, you know, sometimes backlash they can get from some of this stuff. So um, I, you know, I hold them in the highest regard because the game we're playing at the moment is the best game i've ever played and i'm and i've no doubt that ninth edition is going to take that to the next level and i didn't even think it could have got better so if it does then hats off to them absolutely agree with you i think that's a good place to wrap this up and i definitely want to have you on again as we move deeper into the news about ninth and you know when we get ninth in our hands uh, no, I'd love to, Paul. Thanks so much. Where can people find you before you go? Yeah, so my um, all of my stuff is on YouTube, um, and that is my channel, Vanguard Tactics. Um, I've got a podcast myself called the Competitive uh, 40K Podcast, where we talk all about how to help people become a better 40K competitive player. And it's not about winning the game at any cost. It's about winning the game in the right way, um, using strategies, tactics, and hopefully leaving the game in a better place than which we found it. That's kind of my whole thing. So, yeah sportsmanship mindset over on vanguard tactics on youtube is is the place for me it's a great channel please check it out steven man we'll talk again real soon thanks so much paul and take care you're listening to forge the narrative hey everybody we are back it is always cool to talk with steven so adam what i want to ask you do troops matter to you anymore? Like, are you sad about potentially not including them? Do you, does it change the, the way the army looks to you? Do you think it's not going to be competitive if we just unshackle ourselves from needing, you know, two HQs and three troops? Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, there was this, I guess a loop of um, positivity where you got the troops, which gave you the command points, which in turn made your spicy, good units fun that you wanted to take. And then you got the obsec in the troops that won you the missions and, you know, it all felt it all felt like it fitted together very well. But now that it looks like they might be unpinning our reliance on troops. But I think we're still going to need them. And I, I don't think we're going to need them from a GW like or a, necessarily from a rulebook point of view. I think we're going to need them from a mission point of view, and that's that's my hope. My hope is that troops still become the integral mission winners that they have always been. Um, like if I, I do, I do like it. Tick, it tickles my my narrative juices to be able to think, oh, I could just take an army of Lehman Russes, or I just take an army of of uh, Deathwing Terminators, and oh, this is going to be spicy and fun, and it's going to be fantastic. Oh, but definitely. at the same time, I oh, oof, just a company of Death Company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I am a huge fan of armies looking like armies. Remember when you were a kid and you opened up your, you know, you opened up your white dwarf and you saw um, the uh, two narrative armies doing a battle report, and you're like, mm-hmm. I would love an army that looks like that. I want that army. It looks good. It's got everything in it. It's, yeah, looks, that's looks like the it one should. you want. That's ex- that that yeah. exact one. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. But uh, eighth edition, so seventh edition, we moved away from that. I think fifth edition was where things really started, truly started to move away from that. And then sixth edition again as well. 
um, and but for different reasons. Sixth edition moved away from it because of allies and, and things like that. And um, seventh edition was a bit the same. Eighth edition, we've had this big resurgence of armies looking and feeling well rounded. Like you look at a top tier, look at the Castellan list. You know, the, the the curb stomping broke everyone's brains. No one wanted to play anymore. Castellan list. It had a brigade in it. It had six <laughs> troops choices, three elites, three fast attacks, three heavy supports. It looked like an army and a big knight. You know, it looked like an army. It looked like a well-rounded army and it kicked your absolute teeth in. Like it was unfun, <laughs> but it was still a well-rounded looking thematic army. I want that to remain in the game. That's something I love about the game. Yeah, that's, that's, I a, love fair, seeing, that's a fair I, point. Yeah. And that's something that I love that 8th edition has brought back. And now it seems like maybe we might be losing a little bit of that. And I think it's okay to lose a little bit of that. I just don't want to see it gone. Well, I don't want to see... The let, rib- me, like- let me give up a different perspective on that. I don't feel like we're losing it. I think that we'll have more options. So, I mean, in in the one armies that we talked about, Grey Knights, uh, I mean, I you know potentially say some some various variations of Marines like Deathwing, you know, those guys you can still field a very thematic army with this option. Or on the other side, Imperial Guard, you filled it the other way with the actual army men that mm. you're talking about. Uh, you're still going to need. I mean, Marines will probably still need board control, and you, the way you get that is. I mean, I think, in my opinion, like incursors are better than reavers all day long. So you're going to want to go yeah. with some troops. Now, that might not be uh, your classic, you know, version of a troop, but it's still a troop slot. And on top of that, GW's put a lot of effort into making troops good, like actually good in the game. Like Scions, Tempesta Scions. Someone tell me they're bad. Uh, five plus five plus plus um, intercessors from Iron Hands. Someone tell me they're bad. Like. We have uh, Orc Boys. Someone tell me they're bad. Like Gene Stealers. There are so many good troops choices. I I don't think we're going to lose them entirely, but I like having uh, a good positive reason to want to take them. E.g., I hope and I pray that OBSEC uh, remains. And I think it will because they've told us that the codexes aren't changing. So we're going to keep OBSEC in some way. But they've also told us we're getting new missions, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We're getting new missions. And and as far as like Codex Codex is staying, I mean, I have to imagine there's going to be some FAQs or some things that that true up the the additions for sure. And and my last point that I, at least I'll make right now on troops is that I think when you take them going forward, it will actually be because you want to, not because you have to. And there's a there's a ton of value yeah. in that. They'll fit into your strategy, or they'll they'll be a target for a stratagem or something. You know, or you or the obsec thing. I mean, there's going to be a reason you take them other than you were just almost forced to. To, to do yeah. the real exciting things that you really wanted to do. Yeah, well, exactly right. So, I mean, a Blood Angels players don't take, don't necessarily take uh, troops because they want to. They take troops because it makes your Sangard and your Death Company better. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that'll alter. And, yeah. I, and I'm cool with that. Uh, I think this, again, but going on back to playing Catachins, I'm still going to have 30, 40 Catachins at the minimum on the table. Yeah. And that's because they've put some effort into making them good, making them worth taking. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I feel like this little change isn't going to undo all of that, those good works, if that makes sense. Yeah, good point. I mean, I, you know, I hope not. I don't think that it will. I think that mission design is going to be a, a big play in this. And if, you know, the book missions are, the, the book missions are typically a pretty good indicator of how they want the edition to play. Mm. And so we'll get a good idea of that as soon as we see those. Exactly right. So did you hear about this one, the capping of modifiers? Yes. Gone are the days of your minus three janky space elf dudes. Yeah. Gone are okay. the days of your. your you play, you play, uh, sorry, is it minus? Yeah, it was minus two plague bearers. And yeah, I mean, but I think they've done the right thing here. They've, ca- they've, they've modified it, they've capped the modifiers of both ways. So plus one is capped and minus one is capped. That will be interesting to see how it plays out because that will change the way people build their armies. Bar none, Absolutely. You, it, just, it, you were always stacking towards that, but building towards that. You picked a certain craft world to be able to use the stratagem at a certain time. You did, yep. you, you, you banked on it. You had a plane. Hundred percent, man. There was like, yeah. I mean, this this changes. There's already been some flyer changes, which we'll probably touch on. But this is the biggest change for flyers. I think they're going to be. There's going to see because I know. I know as a Dark Angels player, I, I flyers only felt good to me when I could make them minus two. They're probably still good, but they only felt juicy, juicy because I could make them minus two on, on the first turn of the game if I went second. You know, so just they couldn't just knock an out four of them. Flyer, and you don't need all those. Ex- exactly, because you end up having like three or four more wounds. But uh, dark, <laughs> like sorry, Eldar flyers. Um, are Crimson Hunters still the, the powerhouse units they are? I mean, like, so this this is, this actually gets a little bit murky. Stratagems like uh, lightning fast reactions, yeah? Mm-hmm. So if you take Alatok Craft World, that stratagem becomes 
not becomes useless. The only time it would actually come back into effect is if somebody's shooting you and they have plus one to hit, and then well, you have to use your lightning fast reaction to get your minus within one. Within a back. certain range, right? Because the attack I think yep. is over twenty four inches. Tw- yeah, twelve inches. Uh, twelve inches. But yeah, twelve inches. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that, that the, the uses of those stratagems becomes a lot less. It becomes a lot less viable. Now, but where it, it is just still across the board better is armies that don't have stuff like that. Like don't have like Stygis for um, Admech. There is no other way to get an extra minus one for anything in Admech, apart from like you have, you have to soup up um, to get any extra minuses. So them just having minus one across the board is still fantastic because there's no other inherent minuses in there. Whereas you take like, you, there is zero reason to take a, an Eldar plane with Ally Talk now, if that makes sense. They're already minus one to hit. They're already got the best of that buff. There's zero there's zero percent reason. Yep. So and, you'd and always want to take like a custom craft wield or skill shots or whatever. And remember this is a rule, right? So rules can be modified. That's the whole point of codex is, is to modify base rules. So I'm that's, not, you know that's true. Never that doesn't mean we're never gonna see something that breaks that mm. mold in the same way I mean, we see stuff right now. Yeah, I'd be fine to if like, you know, let's say it's something specific to Harlequins. They can they capped at minus two or something or whatnot because that that would be a flavorful addition to them like or maybe it's like lictors or some obscure stuff to try and bring them back into relevance because yeah. that, that could be a cool thing that they do they start sprinkling away these super potent polarizing buffs that we've known and and loathed for so long and just start giving it to stuff that actually needs them uh is a lictor in a forest minus two or minus three to hit baby makes sense as well or maybe you actually just touched on something what if terrain certain terrain features allow you to have an extra minus one or something. I mean, there's yeah, that'd be cool. Yep. We're completely, Cat-a-chans. this is in fuel full on speculation. You know, this is spitballing. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't spitball more. Yeah. Um, but man, Catachans in the jungle, they should get like stronger or more beefy or something. <laughs> just, just putting it out there. <laughs> uh, see in, in me, the optimist is like, okay, you know what? I reserve my two CP for those lightning fast reactions. All the time. Like that's my, my, my I'm locked into yep. spending that. So now maybe if I don't have to, I mean, it's not even an option for me. I get to use some of the other things that are essentially just it wallpaper. Open, it op- opens it up. Right now. Yep, exactly right. I, I And I like those kinds of things. I think they're good. But see, where, where it falls over a little bit, you think of units like uh, Harlequin jet bikes, the Sky Weavers or whatever. They at times need that minus two to be, because they're only toughness four with three wounds. And we know in this day and age, like the Centurions will come down and they'll take out 12 of the things by themselves just one unit oh. um whereas the minus two was a big reason they got to survive because you had to but now that there's like they have multiple ways of getting the, the three plus invuln now maybe you're just like well i guess i just get to make two units three plus invuln instead of two units minus two to hit you and it's, it's the, the same other difference amazing thing oh uh, tell me more now you don't have to buy the harlequin troops you could just buy more of those bikes just buy the bikes three units of bikes and then you don't <laughs> care if you lose a unit because you're yeah, who cares? It doesn't matter. Yeah, you can have one. The other unit's going to waste you. <laughs> That's true. That's actually very true. And But yet, we just saw in that release, they put so much effort into making Harlequin troops bonkers amazing if you yeah, can use them good. right. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, six is always hit. You, you saw that? Six is always hit as well? Yeah, what do you think about that? So I'm not sure if that was actually a necessary change since they already capped the modifiers. So the only time the six is always hitting would make a difference would be to orcs who already have it. So I'm not sure, like, because it doesn't actually make sense if sixes always hit. Who hits on fives apart from orcs that already have the rule? Uh, no one. So I mean, maybe if it's you know you're moving, you're moving, shoot. Actually, here's an interesting one. Yeah, last cannon yeah, let's say and a guard a, army moving and shooting. I was about to say, I was about to say, if I move and shoot with a heavy weapon and give myself minus one, does your minus one still kick in, I'm or is it the same difference? I was always going to take a minus one so I can just move my last cannon judici- judiciously at will. Huh, yeah. that'd be an interesting one. Yeah, I don't know. Don't Cause, know. Because that's, that's actually kind of crap if it makes it. Uh, I would, I would like almost that. assume that um, you're, what you do to yourself probably goes against the, the max. Probably the max modifiers you can stack yourself are this, and the max modifiers the opponent can inflict on yeah, themselves I mean, are sh- unlimited. I don't surely. know. Surely. But, but yeah, but then there's like, okay, well, I can just take heavy weapons at will against armies and like i can just move them around as whatever i want because i'm like i'm only going to take the same penalty anyway so yeah that's actually a thing we'll have to wait and see let's hope let's hope that's a good question though uh, we've talked ourselves into yeah it. that is a i don't know if we, we talked ourselves, ourselves into that or if that is just the logical progression of, of things <laughs> all right give us your thoughts how do you think g double play that one out in the comments i think that's a good one because <laughs> that could go a myriad of different ways i think uh, let's let's take a quick break. I may have another segment to insert. I've got uh, a couple of people lined up for this week, and I hope we get it by the time of release. But then you and I can come out and talk about what got spoiled about Engine War on the community side. Oh, yeah. Juicy. 
see you in a few minutes. FTN is also on Facebook. Please like us at www.facebook.com forward slash forge the narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to a Community Spotlight segment. I'm joined right now by Archon Skari. Hello, denizens. I hope all is well in real space. How are you this evening? I'm fantastic. And by the way, did you know that on the Raider box from Games Workshop, the back calls it a bladed hunting barge? Hmm. I did not know that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, I'm here and I'm ready to rock and roll. And I hope all of you are as well. Well, I brought you on to get your impression of what we know about Knights so far. So this is coming right after we've had one of the Q&As. There's been some stuff up on the the community page. You know, and I know you're following this closely. You, you, you're, you know, I mean, you love to play. You're deep in the hobby. What are you thinking? Well, yes, it has been it's been a really fun like we kind of like knew that ninth edition was coming, but it has been really exciting. I love edition changes. It brings the best and worst out of people. And (laughs) and it's just like a, a time to sort of reinvent everything we know, which I find very, very interesting. And from what we've seen so far, the changes to terrain or terrain becoming a much more impactful um, part of the game to the way command points work to, you know, things like how potential changes to modifiers to hit or whatnot, as well as, um, you know, things like list building and souping and all in all some just some really cool changes that I feel will expand on on what we love about 8th edition. Now, you've been largely a mono faction player for a long time. Yes, I have. Do you feel like this is kind of your time to shine? I mean... Um, well, in terms of mono factioning, I think it's going to affect armies like Eldar, Dark Eldar, and other armies that had easy access to troops that could build battalions to get command points. It's going to have a less of an impact in that sense, whereas it's going to have a big impact on very elite armies like Custodes or whatnot that couldn't really afford two battalions and a brigade. I'm looking at you orcs and Gene Steel cult players, <laughs> where they'd start with, you know, 25 command points to your six command points or sure. something. Right. And I think I think in that sense, it's going to be it's going to help mono faction players like those elite armies that that want to use all their cool stratagems, but can't because they don't want to soup in like the guardsmen to just give them a bunch of command points for no reason. Um, However, I do feel that it's going to be interesting to see the the dynamic that is created between souping your list and how sort of like expensive it is with the command point system. Because as it stands, or as they've been hinting at, command points are going to be used for a variety of different things, whether it's stratagems in-game, unlocking different codexes and different elements to your army, as well as potentially like pre-game stratagems that you can use, and maybe a, a larger variety of generalized stratagems that will affect all factions. Like if you're putting things in strategic reserve, for example, or maybe even modifying some of the terrain rules like who knows you know so i'm really excited to see that and but as a mono faction player it does mean that whatever the command point sort of basis is i'll probably be starting with the maximum amount of command points and that means that i'll have more chances to do cool stuff with them in game and stratagems and things like that so that i'm excited about are you looking forward to maybe not having to take some troop choices or for your army list builds, how vital are troops to what you've been able to accomplish? Troops are still going to have an impact. And I think the value of troops will really be determined by what the mission parameters are. Because if uh, the rule objective secured is shown me anything over the course of the years is I don't care if You have 10 Terminators on this objective. If I have one little grot with objective secured, I can steal it from your 10 Terminators. So you can make a list with a bunch of hard-hitting, nasty units. But if I have a couple of units of objective secured troops, and that is good for the mission parameters of taking objectives and 
and I'm, my objective is to win the mission, then I can see troops still having uh, a big role, not only in that, but also in things like board control and preventing, you know, deep strikes and things like that. So we'll see how that works. I think Jakari have some very compelling troop options as well. Correct. Not only uh, Cabalite Warriors is point for point a really good sort of troop unit, but depending on how terrain and combat and things like that work, you know, uh, witches are good at holding people in combat, for example, but also like coven troops, you know, Prophets of Flesh, Rax, for example, one of the toughest troops to get rid of that can recycle and, um, and are surprisingly resilient for what you expect from a Dark Elder army. We heard some changes to potentially fallback, leaving combat. Yeah, yeah, there there's, seems to be, there'll be a bit of a less, there'll be a way to sort of mitigate the penalty of falling back from combat. And I could see that being sort of like a generalized um, stratagem that somebody could use. So you know, instead of the, the four main stratagems that you have, which are like prepared positions, the reroll, the command point reroll, auto passing a morale test. And uh, there's another one, I think. Is there? Yes, there must be another one. The one that probably I never use or rarely use. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they could add a whole bunch of different things, like falling back and acting as normal from combat, or being able to shoot it like a negative and one. Combat or... interrupt is what you're thinking about. There you go. You do. Thank you, you very you, much. You, I you use that one that a one. lot. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't really think it's called counteroffensive. And <laughs> before you crucify me because I didn't remember the name, nobody calls it counteroffensive. We just know it as I'm going to interrupt you now. <laughs> I, I was thinking about that with the uh, with the command point reroll. It's not called command point reroll. It's something else, right? Yeah, it's strategic something rather. Or but yes, up. I think I think that you know. Not only do does each book have access to its own stratagems that are very faction based, I feel like they're going to expand on that, and there'll be a whole variety of things that you can use command points for. You know, the the whole adding another codex is probably going to be a stratagem that says when you build your army, use two command points to add a detachment from another codex or something. You know, like if if I were a guessing man, that, that's fair. I think that's uh, probably spot on. I mean. It, uh, what the benefit of that does, though, other, if it does anything other than just opening up additional stratagems for you, who knows? Correct. Yeah, but that's the thing is, is it's it that is why you would bring you bring it in. You want to bring a knight with your admech, or you want to bring a knight with your astrum of the tarum. You're paying command points to bring a knight, which will unlock other stratagems and other cool combos that you can build. However, it'll have to be a well thought out combo where you're using now a reduced and more limited amount of stratagems to make it happen. Now, what do you think about the changes to the blast weapons? That is something that I'm curious to see how it works. Like we saw a taste of that in the uh, Astrum of the Tarum Psychic Awakening rules where you could pay a command point and your battle cannon gets, or your, your tank commander gets maximum amount of shots against a tank, right? So there's like, a precedence there? Wait a second. I just, it just occurred to me there may be a generation of players that we have to explain what blast weapons are. Correct. Well, blast weapons were generally template weapons where you know they were literally a circle of plastic that you put on the table. I know. And they were Not molded to stuff. look like an explosion. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they were usually green or transparent, um, uh, just plastic. And it would physically tell you what models got hit so if you were a player that clumped all your models together yes a big explosion <laughs> would would tend to affect more models that were close together so actually placing your models not in a clump it was usually good against blast weapons now blast like blast markers are not coming back they're just getting like a blast category which will give them bonuses for number a of label shots. on the weapon it will be a label exactly. on the profile of the weapon which will give them a bonus against a horde style unit, which as for the FAQ is just a larger unit. Like they haven't really defined what a blast weapon is and they haven't really defined what a horde unit is. However, I would probably say it's something, you know, 20 or more models for a horde unit, I would assume is a quick description. 
However, it might be a sliding scale because, you know, you could be like, oh, I'm just going to make all my units 19 models, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> because we gamers will game everything. And they did say, or they did say in the reveal that it was something like frag missiles, you know, battle cannons, that sort of stuff. They, you know, and that sort of mechanic of things that are just high explosive rounds. If you have a well, bunch I mean, of guys. Anything with a D6, D3 or yeah. whatever could probably be in that blast category. Correct. And they have mitigated the random shots with a lot of the newer books. You know, instead of a D6, it's two D3 shots, for example. Um, one of the biggest examples is The Exorcist from The Sisters of Battle, which was D6 shots and now has two different profiles. And one is three D3 shots, and then the other one is like three D6 shots or something crazy. But, you know, it just gives you that sort of um, dynamic when you're trying to kill a horde of orcs and you've got your battle cannon, you don't want the battle cannon to roll snake guys because it's going to kill one orc. It's miserable. It's <laughs> miserable. Two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that smoothing of the, of the curve a bit, you know, as far as what you can expect, what you can expect your army to accomplish, uh, depending on the various styles of army list that you will encounter. Agreed. And you That's would think that um, a line of, of tanks, Lehman Russ tanks would be really good against Horde armies, but right now it isn't. Horde armies are talking about models, uh, armies where the model counts are a hundred plus. Correct. You know, especially when you do have like random dice that it's you have such a high end on the high end, but such a such a low end on the low end, and. You know, when that person walks up to the table, and I'm talking match play mainly, like competitive play, and they put, you know, 200 grots on the table, and they go, I hope you have enough bullets to kill 200 grots, because even if you, every one of your shots hits and kills a grot over the course of the game, a lot of armies have a hard time getting through that many things, let alone, you know, a battle cannon that goes, okay, and, oh, great, now the curve is ruined because I rolled two ones. <laughs> Yep. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. these. Uh, the things that we've heard at the very top level sound encouraging. You know, it's uh, encouraging to to try new things with list things that you would never even consider for play before now or circulating to my mind. Like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if we got to put this on the table? I think this is one of the things I love about edition changes. You get to be so creative, and you know, someone that starts the game when the edition is changed, and someone who started the game. When, like in eighth edition, there's a like a very short period of time where you know you're sort of on a a, a more similar playing level field, it's like true. a level playing field. Like you're you're both still like don't get me wrong, somebody who's played the game for twenty years will probably pick up a lot of the dynamics quicker than somebody who's just picking up from scratch. Well, you're comfortable moving the models around. That's actually what 100. I tell people as as, right. as I'm training them and teaching them to, to be better at the game is like, just get comfortable moving your models. And that goes a long way. The rule, you know, the rules will come, but when you know how to move your models carefully and precisely, that's, that's something you never forget. That's right. And, you know, so you and I, we know how to move our models on the table. We know how to use little things like deployment or look for specific things within a rule set to kind of give us, you know, to a better understanding of the rules. But when it comes to list building and ideas and stuff, like we're going to get surprised by somebody who started the game when ninth edition came out and looked at a, a concept and goes, ooh, this is really cool and I want to try this. And then just blows people out of the water with it or puts it on online and then everybody kind of picks up and goes, this is great, you know? <laughs> yep. And I think we all have that sort of potential right now of being in that very creative, fun state where we can just pick out the cool, shiny stuff and just try it and see what sticks. Let's fair break open our, our, you know, our deep model collections. That's right. It's a, one of the reasons I like doing monofaction is no matter what the edition and rule changes, I have one of everything, at least for my army. So if something becomes good and or bad, I can just cycle it through and I just have it on the shelf already. Is there something that you have right now that you hope becomes really good? Um, well, it'd be more with the change of the actual Dark Eldar book, but I'd like to see my Incubi come back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're just so cool yeah, and Drazar's, Drazar is amazing he's made it into every list but I just hope that there's a way to just keep them alive for a little bit longer than just you know if the raider dies that they're in they all die <laughs> so well, maybe some obscuring so, terrain is just what the doctor ordered for you 
Maybe. I'm really excited to see how much control we as players will have on that whole terrain setting process. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be something to talk about, uh, you know, for podcast subjects for a while is terrain, like, to, you know, table size, uh, how it dictates the type of terrain and what that means and stuff. Man, there's there's mm-hmm. so much to unpack here. Yeah, I love it. And I think it's it's I like the fact that GW is getting involved with that sort of sort of like that aspect of the game being like, hey, if you're playing a 1500 point game, uh, this is the table that we recommend. And if it's a match play game, we recommend this style of terrain or this much terrain on the board so that, you know, you don't get blown off the table. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, create a good experience for folks. Exactly. Yeah, well, Scar, man, thanks for taking the time out with me. I hope to have you on again really soon. Absolutely, Paul. Thanks for having me on. And to the Forge, the Narrative Nation, keep on gaming. Yeah, I can't wait to start talking about Army List and stuff with you as soon as oh, we get. It's going to be so exciting. You too, man. Have a, great, <laughs> have a great night. You too, bud. Bye. You're listening to Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to a community spotlight segment of Forge Narrative. I am Paul, your host. I'm joined right now by Val Huffafinger. Oh my, that spotlight sure is bright, Paul. How are you? Yo, man, thanks for joining me. I'm making the rounds, getting everybody's opinions on, you know, basically what their take on Ninth is. And I got some questions for you. Want to hear what you're thinking? Well, you know what they say about opinions, Paul. Everybody has them. <laughs> well, you know, we have we have heralded maybe your uh, uh, challenges on the tabletop on shows before. Oh, what? what? What are you talking about here? What are you talking about here? I, this I'm one, not this one host, Paul. I didn't say like limited success. I could have said limited success. Well, you know, I, I just said challenges. Hey, I've won a major by default. OK, I've I've almost made a top table once or twice. It's been a good run for me as far as I'm concerned. Of course, I've given you a hard time. But, <laughs> you know, I know you've got some uh, some strong opinions about the game and really wanted to hear, you know, what you what from what you've heard about ninth so far Mm -hmm. what are you thinking what are you most excited about well first of all i mean anyone who's heard me breathlessly rant about uh ninth edition will probably have dismissed me as an uncredible fanboy of games workshop and what they're up to um i have to say i'm pretty i'm pretty stoked to see what they do with what they've identified as the the things that they're addressing so you know like terrain flyers um a narrative a narrative focused gameplay mode which i think is brilliant for um, I've said that, that like that's like the best way to achieve Warhammer World Peace is make sure that like the narrative types have something that's theirs and the, the match play competitive types. They've got something that's theirs. I think that's a really brilliant way to do it. And plus, narrative play needs some guidance, too. Right. Like It's not just uh, having a sandbox. It's, you know, having some toys in that sandbox and well, maybe some pre preset narratives and things to be able to follow and play along with. I think it's a great thing. Narrative play is one of those things. Like I can make up a story or, or I can find some reference in the lore to justify whatever I want to do. But this sure. is going one step beyond that. You can make whatever you want. And then your army evolves with you as your, your story grows through battle. Yeah. And I mean like, you know, role playing games, they're games, right? They've got rules. They've got, they've got structure, you know, yes. Um, you know, you can, you can, you have a lot more uh, license to create and do your own thing, but it's just, it's just always awesome to have, a you know, some tracks to maybe learn more about that style of play and how to approach the game that way. And that's, even I'd be interested in, in progressing some dudes and, and having a good time. That's an excellent point. It's that context. You, you know how awesome you are because you're operating within the structure that lets you be awesome. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the game originally had uh, a DM in it, right? Like, um, Rogue Trader had, had a third player. You that know, is the truth. You had to have a game marshal or whatever to, whatever was, to let, yeah. you, let you know when the, the slan lizard mage or whatever zapped your in- inquisitor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I wasn't there at the time, um, but um, I was probably still into pogs. But um, I would say that, you know, that to me has always been like, why don't they, you know, for a true narrative, why not have a totally different game for a narrative play? So. I don't know if necessarily Crusades are going to go that far down the rabbit hole, but ideally it does give, you know, narrative inc- narratively inclined players or players who aren't just all about the PVP experience, you know, something that they can sink their teeth into. Or even, you know what, like something for a group of guys who get together or, or gals to 
play on a weekly basis, something to just tie all their games together into a cool thread. There's all, all kinds of neat stuff that can come from it. That is cool. I've had, I've had several people uh, like message me about the Crusade system and be really pumped about it as a as another excuse to get models on the table. And sometimes that's what people need. They need that little bit of motivation to to build that next model, go out that week or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think also when you think of some of the, the bugaboos of, you know, why why 8th edition ruins my immersion, uh, you know, you might have you know the weirdness that is that is flyers. I, I kind of forget a little bit about how awkward some of the stuff was in the in the seventh to eighth edition transition. Like flyers was one of those things, but I just accepted it. But and then they became a subject for abuse right out of the gate. Like flyers immediately ruined 40k <laughs> with 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 the uh, with the storm raven spam lists and stuff. Uh, you know, like uh, th- those were a lot of fun. Not. Uh, um, and then you know even things like no blast markers, which originally was something that made people upset because you know now 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 you don't have to be tactical you don't have to space your dudes right if you're going up against Lehman Russes and then I think we after that we discovered that a d6 roll doesn't wind up killing a lot of stuff you know like <laughs> unless it's <laughs> unless it's got a lot of wounds you know you're maybe punking one or two models with that battle cannon so having that new blast rule sounds like it's it's good and also whatever this sh- tanks and monsters in combat being able to shoot stuff is we'll see how that goes I imagine it's not going to be unfettered ballistic skill, but we'll see. I don't know. I, I'm really curious. Mostly what I'm curious about is they've identified to me the right places. Like they, they've, they've, they've said, okay, these are definitely the areas we need to improve. Terrain. We need to improve this. Now the big question is, are their solutions good? Right? And we don't know that yet. Yeah, that's the truth. And that's where you know, it could – I don't think it's going to miss the mark though. I think that they're, they've gotten a lot of feedback. I think that there is a desire – I mean, I shouldn't say that. I, there's probably always been a desire, but now I think desire has married with the the right exchange of information, a good mix of ideas uh, to give us something that's going to be a lot better. Yeah, uh, ideally, yes. Um, and you've seen, and I guess sometimes this happens where you know a design philosophy will shift mid edition. Actually, you saw this in seventh, like seventh edition. You had the the advent of. Um, formations you know detachments of detachments <laughs> and that happened mid edition and it was like necrons on and then like everyone before necrons was just like hey uh guys and then everyone after necrons even for a little while the necrons themselves suddenly had this massive leg up on on everybody else in in that edition so psychic awakening kind of had a similar impact maybe not as much even as like the clear design philosophy gear shift that was space marines see i I feel good about psychic awakening i think psychic awakening brought a lot of things from that c tier at least up to the b and sometimes the a and 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 left basically nothing behind yeah i you know i mean some i mean everyone got something some People were richer than others, though. You know, everyone got a little bit in their pockets. Some people just got a little bit more. And that's fine. That's fine. But it was a, also just a, a real, it was a change in maybe how some armies played uh, versus how they did earlier in the edition. And that's and that's cool. And they also, by the way, something that's great about the new era of 40K is just that once upon a time, it would take them three years to release, uh, you know, eight books you know, <laughs> whereas whereas now that's that's like a annual cycle. So that's that's pretty fantastic. And we're going to see the same thing now with with codexes. Codexes are going to come hot and heavy, I'm sure. And uh, we're we're going to very, very quickly have a, a very different game. Anything that you, like really leaps out to you? Anything that you particularly enjoy? Th- those are the high points. What what I'm really anxious to see is just uh, how the the vehicles and stuff and monsters get brought back to the table. I, I've talked about this in some other segments that people will, may have heard last week, but you know, there's just some of these giant you know gnarly monsters and and cool tanks that you just never see because the rules are so against them. Like they may have just marginal like stats. And hmm. you, you want to play with them, but then you when you when you combine that with like some clunky rules rules that are that act against them, uh, like they're yeah. going against the grain or whatever, you just don't see them. And I, I think that's it's going to open it up. I mean, I think we are getting towards you know a shakeup, of course, with a new edition. But I think that shakeup is going to come in the fact of just making more things viable. Yeah, and, and ideally, well, that's one of the great things about a, a you know a, a wholesale edition change is suddenly, at least in your imagination, for a few moments before you know top tier players you know ruin everyone's day, everything might be good, right? So like you can 
you can open those books and look at everything again with with fresh eyes because you know maybe something has changed that has brought a unit you like i don't know like a stampa maybe suddenly that's relevant i think uh, stampa the word stampa is banned on the gw chat i've Twitch. heard i've heard that pray typing hashtag pray for stampa which is something i've tried to get trending with no luck for many years <laughs> um, <laughs> will get you kicked out immediately from the games workshop that can't right? be so, true yeah you're not like there it's it's a uh, yeah, there's a strong anti stomp bias out there. Look, it's fine. Well, there oh, may I... be some, you know, what are firewalls in the rule set that prevent some of this stuff from, from getting un- unintentionally out of control, like with max of minus one or plus one to hit. I think that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, again, like, it looks like they are adding constraints. And this was a design philosophy that they didn't have coming into 8th edition. If there was, a, if there's like a story that talks about the evolution of the 8th edition rule set, it's adding constraints to make, to make um, you know, the people who are playing it have to choose things. Yeah, <laughs> you know? the, some, some amount of scarcity, whether that be uh, yeah. through command points of detachment yeah. uh, manipulation, the rule of three. Yeah, use, was, use of similar named stratagems. You know, these are all things that were stapled on through the way. Right. And that's, you know, that's called the economy of choice. Right. And the economy of choice and, and the the more valuable each decision is essentially translate to more you know, tactical play because you are making important economic choices all the way through the game. And that's what makes it crunchy. That's what makes it good. So, like, for example, the command point thing, I think they thought. I think it was motivated from a, a really good place, the original system, which is we're going to give the the uh, the detachments that um, have the most amount of you know troops and the things that will look the most like a Warhammer 40,000 army. Tax, yeah. You know, we're going to give those guys the most command points, and therefore we'll be encouraged to see a lot of troops on the table. But we're also going to let anyone make whatever they want with the other detachments. And by the way, you can have... <laughs> Literally any keyword rocking out with any keyword with very limited downside. That was out of the gates, right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen people complaining a little bit or concerned about the new command point structure where it's just, you know, essentially based on the size of the game that you're playing in. Have they, I I don't think I've seen yet how they exactly uh, plan to to, uh, divvy that out, like how many CP at 2000 and 1500 or whatever. At, At time of recording, that has not been released. There you go. So I, I don't know. Um, I've seen like 15 rumored for a 2000 point game. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, I have no idea if that makes any sense at all. So maybe it's dumb. Um, but anyway, I, I actually really like this idea because I think command points and whether or not, you know, if a custodian's army suddenly has 10 command points, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be like super overpowered, even though they don't have to take any you know of their troops. They can just have jet bikes or whatever. Um, because a lot of their 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 command, a lot of their stratagems are just by default expensive. Whereas you can have, there's a lot of other armies where they have a lot more cheaper strats, like the orcs out of the gate. A lot of their strats were super cheap, so that might balance out. Another thing I'm really curious about is how much of the eighth edition errata and uh, FAQs will be rolled back. Like for example, what about uh, things that allow you to recycle command points? Because everyone's at a set amount, does that mean that now there won't be a limit on it? Oh, very interesting. I, I I'm willing to bet we're going to keep the the pl- the only one per turn as just a bit of another control mechanism potentially. Um, but if if yeah, I don't know. Like again, I've I've no idea. I'm very curious to see where that goes, and also I'm curious to see how they handle the transition because there will need to be errata and FAQs and things to to massage. You know, things that were designed for eighth edition to fit and work in whatever the new ninth edition paradigm is. As I understand it, the FAQs will be updated at the time of release to reflect the, the current rules. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's a lot of stuff. So I'm sure we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to find some cracks. There will be facts to the facts. <laughs> there, will be, there will be some facts on top of facts. So that's fine. Um, I think actually, like I've seen people complain about this, but I think it's BS to complain, which is, look, we're playing a beta and we will always be playing a beta. And that's why it's awesome. You know, like, I wouldn't say it's a beta. I mean, I, we are we're, we get we get patches. Yeah, but I mean, there's never there's never going to be a Warhammer 40k 1.0. Like we're always going to be like just because of the, of the way they iterate and the way that you know we find ways to break the game. 
and just imbalances appear yeah, 100%. It will always be a work in progress. And I, honestly, I think that is a good thing. It because is. You can, you can look at Magic and other, other games. I mean, heck, you can look at World of Warcraft, I, I would imagine, or uh, Hearthstone. You know, mm-hmm. they're updating things, tweaking things all the time to make sure that the environment is healthy, that whatever the standard, whatever the, the gameplay environment is healthy and thriving. They do that. And every popular game does it. Yeah, for sure. Well, well I yeah, should say every popular I'll, game. I mean, chess is pretty much, you know, locked down. And, you know, I don't know if there's many rules updates in Monopoly anytime soon. But you know what? You know what a rules update in Monopoly is? It's actually reading the Monopoly rules. <laughs> I don't think I don't think anyone knows actually what happens in Monopoly. What's supposed I, whenever I enforce people to play actual Monopoly, they get upset with me. Yeah, because most of most of I think the reason why everyone thinks Monopoly takes four hours is literally because no one wants to bankrupt anybody. So yeah, they, they come up with they, different trade rules and stuff. And <laughs> they also they put so much money into the game. So like, you know, you get money for free parking, you get money if you land on luxury tax or whatever. Like there's just different ways that, you know, they put more money in. And that means it takes longer for everyone to run out of money. So the game lasts forever. If you play Ruthless Monopoly by the by the book, you're not there until 2 a.m. Just play by the rules and it won't take too long, guys. Well, what I'm saying is that most games, especially with this kind of complexity, get the updates from time oh, yeah. to time patches. And, and so, I mean, maybe it was new to us, but it's not new to us anymore. I think we can all kind of go with the flow. And, and I think, I, I do think that, that generally most people are okay with it at this point. I remember back when I was more regularly on forge, the narrative I uh, was exposed to, it was back when kill team was coming out a lot. So you guys were talking about kill team and I was like, Oh God, yeah. gee willikers guys, what's kill team all about? <laughs> and, uh, as a result, I got a little curious. I actually even played a couple games. But most importantly, I noticed when for Nova 2018, they released, and by they I mean Games Workshop released this competitive tournament pack for Kill Team. And it was it was an actual thing. It had preset terrain. It had limits on how the roster system worked. It was this actual tournament format with a you know Games Workshop emblem and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. on it. And at the time, I was very excited because I thought that meant that imminently we would see, you know, the the Unite the Clans GW approved tournament pack. And it does look like we're finally getting it. And I think that is such an awesome development for the game. And it's just really, really wonderful and probably has a little bit of something to do with, you know, um, Mr. Brandt turning pro. Yeah, absolutely. It has to. It has to, right? I mean, dude's been, uh, you know, a good... A uh, positive force in the competitive scene. I mean, that's and going to bring that expertise and and knowledge and community level you know, engagement. I shouldn't say community, like community building uh, steeped in the community. Uh, it, it's going to lead to because tournament missions. I mean, ter- missions, objective based games influence how we play, what we take. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you can truly make missions that encourage people to take whatever they want. You know, with, with a competitive or with with an uh, with an objective base uh, goal, it's going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be great. And uh, with regards to this, apparently Reese uh, has said that if you're a regular tournament player, the new missions will be familiar to you, which is awesome to to hear because that sounds like the sort of asymmetrical mission style may make it. Which, by the way, everybody, the Nova missions happened, and then the ITC missions took a lot of good ideas from the Nova missions. It wasn't the other way around. And they've also been working together on the playtesting team this whole time. There's like a bit of a conspiracy theory here that there's going to be like an East West East Coast West Coast throwdown over 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 the fact that um, you know suddenly now there's going to be official missions. What is the ITC going to do? Uh, They're going to play the good missions. Yeah, we're all on the same team as far as that kind of stuff goes. I mean, it, the ITC missions are an amalgamation of basically every good idea that's ever been out for missions. 100p, and they will be the first ones to tell you that. Yeah. And they will also be the first ones to be like, oh, we don't have to eat poop like two or three times a year when we have to like make tweaks to these missions. Great. Someone else. Can, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> let's let let's let the let's let the shield take those blows and, uh, you know, they can update them and chapter approve it every year. And when you uh, get missions like this that we all can. I mean, it's really we, we, we need that common language between us when we. So you and I can go anywhere in the world and throw down a game of 2000 point where before K, we all know what to expect. And, I think and that's better. I, I think it's I, I really like the idea of like a homogenous competitive scene playing the same missions. I like that by the by the same token. I do not feel hard done by, you know, with the exception of maybe Adepticon missions. I do like like Nova missions are awesome. ITC missions are awesome. I love 
the ETC, WTC approach and style as well. I think they're all perfectly good. And by the way, spoilers, the same people win in all formats. (laughs) (laughs) The same good players will show up and they will beat you no matter the mission type. So we're going to see the same guy. They will, however, sometimes modify stuff. A lot of times they don't. They just even play in the same armies. So we're going to see the same guys out there, but, you know, we'll all be on the same page. It will hopefully cut down on, you know, regional tribalism. Well, I mean, you know, OK, let's, let's what you're go. Playing, what you're playing isn't real 40K. You know, I've heard that a thousand times. Um, that will all go away, which is fantastic. The, the beauty of it is that though once this game goes out there and in your own personal hands, you can play whatever you want. And if the missions are not scratching the itch, then something will come along and we'll fix it. So, I mean, yep. play whatever you want. But you got to play your own personal game, some of this stuff. And in and the, and the tournament formats, the, most tournaments are concerned with making sure you get there and have a good time. Yeah. And so uh, don't, don't even stress about whether or not the missions are going to be good. They're going to be good one way or another. I'm just what I guess what I'm driving at is the odds are if you've played a popular 40k tournament format, any of the big ones, uh, odds are the people who are heavily involved in designing those formats are playtesters straight up. Therefore, if those guys are able to agree on a on, on, on a set of missions, which is also kind of an amazing thing, then that's probably going to be a pretty good mission pack. And it's going to probably incorporate a lot of the cool ideas that you see in a lot of the independent tournaments. So. I think this is probably going to be a really great evolution. I do too. I think it's going to, it's going to be amazing. So it's, it's, it's going to be awesome. There's no, there's people should be going into this stuff with, is there a positive anxiety? Is it called excitement at that point? I think that's, I think that is exactly the definition of excitement. Okay. There you go. Yeah. With, uh, with whatever we just said is that's what people should be looking forward to in this, in this edition, because I, I mean, things are going to change. I've, I've right? Also, I also like the, uh, the telling people to be cautiously pessimistic. You know, like that's a good way to approach it too. Like, yeah, sure. Be nope. upset. Just be ready to be wrong. I am going full bore headlong into this. I mean, look, man, I can't wait to start rolling dice again. This is, I mean, we got all this stuff coming about. Hopefully as we get to actually play this game across from another human being at some point in the future. Everything, everything else to the side. I particularly like this announcement because I have entirely forgotten the fact that I can't even play 40k if I wanted to right now. Like, and that's actually a really nice thing because it upsets me. Yep. <laughs> so, so like just the fact that I'm distracted enough that I'm like just dreaming about what might what me, might be. And I would probably also have zero interest in eighth edition at this point because there's a new thing coming. Why would I do that? So, yeah, I think I think this has been a, a nice breath of fresh air. And I, I'm glad to see, you know, a lot less arguing about, you know, flattening curves and whether or not you should wear a mask and a lot more arguing about whether or not there's a conspiracy to keep Tau down. And I, I'm a list builder, man. I can't wait to get some different rules in there to see what's good. I mean, I like I, I like to kind of. I mean, I've got my favorite armies, but I like to kind of bounce around and I like to to dabble in other stuff. And I think this is for at least for the first few weeks, maybe even a few months. I'm gonna it's gonna be like a dabbler's paradise. Absolutely, uh, especially until that meta forms, right? So um, it's it's gonna be oh super cool. I can't wait to. The other good thing is like there's always those forlorn models in your collection that you love and. They may still not be able to get on the table, but right now, folks, there's hope. Maybe that Stampa, <laughs> maybe he will be good. Maybe he will get out there. And that's all you could ever hope for. Crossing our fingers, man. Well, Val, thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. I want to have you more often on more often, especially while you're in kind of hiatus from your, your gig. I've I've definitely uh, gone back to my old ways of wandering the, the podcast planes. And just checking in on all the people all, all around. So happy to swing by whenever you have me. Awesome, man. Well, have a great rest of your night, and we'll talk again real soon. Yeah, I sure hope so. Good night. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games, Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. We are back going to jump to the engine war stuff but before i do i want to make a quick aside you know we saw some uh insights into the trailer today that also got published by the where community site is about advancing the story i think we may be on to something with some of the thoughts we were having on the last episode which ones well it goes on to to say uh well it didn't go on to say it it says in the trailer that our imperium of a thousand worlds well, the Imperium is like a million worlds as we know it right now. Yeah. So something's different. It's not ours, as in the person talking, the narrative of the Ultramarine. Oh, it's the Necron saying. 
Uh, no, it's, it's the Ultramarine. Saying, the, the Ultramarine is. Oh, they've yeah. got a thousand wheels now. They used to have five hundred. I guess they doubled they've up. Been, they've been conquering behind the scenes. They're uh, gene steal cults in disguise. Yeah, you know, we, <laughs> who knows what's what this really means? But you know, we were talking about something. You know, we were theorizing about something happening to the Emperor or whatever, and Gilliman doing this, Gilliman doing that. I mean. Mm. You know, a long time ago, we uh, on this show gave some like wild out there theories about um, the emperor at one point dying and then coming back as a bunch of different emperors. Not, you know, because that's that was the old lore, like the star child lore and the senseis mm. and uh, potentially more primarchs coming back and, and creating their own little kingdoms and stuff like this is. Yeah. Who knows where this is going to go, man? I know I keep saying that, but I'm just, I mean, this is what I just think about this stuff all day. So I got nothing but wild theories. Same. I love it, dude. I love the little <laughs> intrigue. So theories. Engine war, psychic awakening. It's, it's hard to believe, but yep. Psychic awakening is still happening. Mm -hmm. And despite all this insanity and, and new rules and all this stuff, we're still going to be getting a book that's up for pre-order this weekend. Yeah. Two books. Yeah. I don't know when the other one's coming up, but it's, it's coming, yeah, coming up pretty soon. And they gave us some pretty spicy spoilers today from it. And, you know, you get forge yeah. your own path, build. There's two, there's a prime, same thing as we've seen, you get a primary and like a secondary trait. And this mm. radiant disciples, when, uh, when resolving an attack made with a ranged weapon against an infantry unit with a dogma that is not within 12 inches, subtract one from the strength characteristic of that weapon for that attack. That is, I think that's phenomenally good. For anybody who doesn't quite know about Breaches and Destroyers, who are Toughness 5, that is incredibly good. Um, that means unless you're Toughness 6, you're wounding them on 5s. So it's you're needing anti-tank weapons to kill these guys. And then there's the second one, the Omnisized Shield, where it's always made attack made with a melee weapon against an infantry unit with this dogma reduced the armor penetration characteristic by 1 for that attack. So I'm instant, instantly thinking of Breaches here. Um, hello, tracing back to our previous discussion, which is a troop's choice. Um, it's but you so see, these are two, two troop choice. Two, pr yeah, it's two premium buffs for infantry. But yeah, uh, breaches are a troops choice, and they're actually a phenomenal troops choice. But uh, with them being minus one, so they have a three plus save innately, and there's a lot of we know there's a lot of ways to get plus one save for admech being like the canticles and the, the stratagems and whatnot. Um, they're being sitting on a two plus save, and then it's uh, minus one strength against them from shooting and then minus one rend against them in combat I think that is two very significant buffs for any army that's going to pivot around those on top of that um, I, I know around here there's been a lot of people using the the toaster boats mm -hmm. um, and put it packing them full of rangers or vanguard with special weapons both of those all those special weapons all those good special weapons need to get within about 18 inch range to be re relevant and both of these buffs become better the closer you get um, especially the uh, other size shield. Well, sorry, they're more likely to become relevant the closer you get. So I am a big, big, big fan. The fact that they're, in, I'm, I'm thankful, very, very, very thankful that they're infantry locked uh, because you could do some crazy stuff if it wasn't locked to infantry. Those are great. I still think the Mars one is better. Yeah, tell us about that. Is it Pangeric Procession models? Yeah, they really. Man, they uh, they love their tongue twisters. <laughs> models in affected units do not suffer the penalty for moving and firing heavy weapons. Increase the strength characteristic of heavy weapons models in the affected unit are equipped with by the so this is a new this is a new canical. So you yeah. can choose this uh, or roll it up at a game. And we know Mars gets two of these, and then with Call gets to to re-roll any of the dice and gets both. So I wonder where they're going to put this. Is this when you roll? Because it's got they've got six doc, they've got six um, canicles, yeah, and you usually roll a dice for them. If you're getting a seventh added in there, how does that work when you're only rolling a d6? Maybe that's just, or you, you, just get the, you get a base one. That's just the one that is. Cool. Okay. I don't know. I mean, no, fair enough. More will be revealed. But, but yeah, this is this is a big deal. This is a big deal because um, firstly, the uh, you think about people use the, the mass stratagem on a max unit of Castellan robots. They're now strength seven. That's that's instantly what I thought big, of. Big change. On top of that, I think the Onyga Dune Crawler, the neutron laser, that's strength 10. That going to strength 11 probably isn't a big deal. But the Icarus Array, all of the profiles of that going up by one strength, I think oh, that is a big deal. That's a great point. Because, yeah, it'd be every profile of that goes up by one. There, I know there's a strength 6 profile and there's an autocannon profile. So the autocannon profile would go to strength 7. And then, so strength 8, essentially becoming a pseudo battle cannon. Like, yeah, I think that's really significant. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking the sound of that. The Stooges one they told us about, um, affected units can shoot in a turn which they fell back. 
uh, for unit does so when resolving attack, it's minus one from the hit roll. So they essentially become ultramarines for a turn. So you pick your turn. Oh, they all charge me this turn. Well, I need to fall back, so I'm going to pick this this canticle. We're going to fall back. We're going to waste you. I think um, with, with stigies, you, you do really end up nice. a little closer to the enemy than you want to be sometimes. And so it, it yeah, you, you're able, you, you find yourself kind of locked in assault, maybe, you know, needing to More get out. More often than others. Mm. Uh, and how yeah, layered fair. defense or you move up or come in from a side. Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is going to be good for them. This next one is they're talking. They're talking about some holy order warlord traits. Holy order, interesting. Um, interesting choice of words. Divination of the Magos. At the start of your turn, you can select one of the aura abilities below. So this is a warlord trait that essentially is going to give you another aura ability, and you've got an option of three. First one being overload safeguards when resolving an attack made with a ranged weapon by a friendly forge world model within six. Unmodified hit rolls of six score one additional extra hit. Now that's an aura of six inches. From if it's on a Dominus, is a forty or fifty mil base. That's a big bubble, and you can put a lot of guns in that bubble. God, and you think about this. This is you know the Forge World is in is in brackets there, so you can pick what you want. Uh, yeah. That's, I mean, think about when you pair it with things like Fury of Mars, mm-hmm. going to be just melting things. Oh, okay. So you, um, I'm just just reading what they've described the Holy Orders as. So each Holy Order gives you a choice of three abilities to select at the start of one of your turns, throw in your lot with uh, the different Magi and get these abilities. So there's going to be a couple of different ones of these. I thought I, I thought this was the only one for a, a moment. The next one is the aggressive subroutines. You can reroll charge rolls whilst you're within six of this Warlord. Now, where that gets interesting is that there's already um, some ways to get pluses to your charges through things like using the Manipulus. It gives you a plus one advance and plus one charge. You could get pretty aggressive when you want to, I think. I think there's a, now there's enough stuff on the bone that you can say, hey, if I want to launch at you, for whatever reason, even though maybe you're a gun liner or not, if I have to, I can. They're never getting away from your walkers. Yes, those dragoons are going to catch you. Yeah, the predatory programming is the last one, at least in this list. When a friendly forge world unit within six inches of this warlord advances, roll one additional d6 and discard one of the dice when making the advance roll. Predatory ah, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's actually very similar to what Tau have. Actually, this does. Why is that? Is this like what Ethereals have got for Tau? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a little bit like that. But that that last one is um, straight out of the Tau Ethereal playbook. But yeah, it's very good as well. Very, very, very good. So this stratagem has got me excited. The electrophilament countermeasures. Use this stratagem at the end of your movement phase. Select one Archaeocopter. I already uh, hate it. Unit, <laughs> yeah, unit equipped with the command <laughs> uplink for your army. Until the start of your next turn, enemy models or abilities have no effect while within six inches of that unit. Of the Archaeothropter. Yep. Warfter. Whatever, Warfter, whatever it is. Which is a, which I'm thinking, and from the pictures, it's a big model. Um, six inches from it is a six inches from the base or from the model? Uh, because that's a big difference there. I'd assume it's from the base because it's a flyer. Because the, six yeah. inches from the wings, it's probably already six inches off the ground. If you want to get silly neck beardy with it, you're probably not doing anything then. But uh, it's still a big base. It's still a big flyer base. It's a giant base. And then with the ability to. Now you're only turning off, because, you know, really in the enemy's turn, they can move and get out of your out of it yeah probably but s- somebody's got a super tight locked down space marine gun line you find this bad boy up there turn off all those aura abilities that being the five up feel no pain the five up six up feel no pain from their um, apothecary their re-rolls to hit from their chapter master re-rolls to wound from their whatever's well the and you turn and all wounds, those off I think they'll be able to unless it's in the assault phase right because you could you could easily do you know uh turn that off in the assault phase if you needed to but mm. you're you're really gonna i think be using this to shut down defensive abilities so your shooting is more effective yeah exactly right but i i, I like the idea of moving this up to the start of your next turn so all the way through their turn so if you i like the idea of just flying this up and saying if you don't move if you don't move oh, your yeah, castle and until- rearrange if that's and right. rearrange your gun line, it's just going to be phenomenally worse for this next turn. I, I like the idea of flying this up there and saying, you have to move out of the way. Like You have to break up your formation. You well, have to break I, up I your I think lines. until the start of your next turn, enemy model or his ability have no effect while it's in six inches of that unit. Yeah, so yeah, they have to move out of the way, which they will. They'll move to let, get their offensive things to work, but you are... And then- it opens up so many options, so many like mistakes that they could possibly make, so many ways to, yeah, yeah, to That's get true. in there and mess with them. I like it a lot. Yeah, every every time your opponent has to is put into a decision chain, you know, they can make a bad one. This, I think this is an ex- a very exciting strategy and probably one of the more powerful ones we've seen recently. I liked it a lot, and I, I was expecting stuff like this to make people want to buy the flyer, <laughs> but, uh, but ugly dragonfly looking 
I think. I like anyway, it, man. So, I know. So, I, know I guess I we, just... we can maybe, there's a lot more here, so please check out the, the community site if you haven't already. But the, there's also a designer's commentary between uh, Jess Goodwin and Darren Latham, who you know, are both extremely talented mm-hmm. folks. And they, they talk about their how they basically got to go wild with the design of these AdMech models. They, they actually go on to say that people seem to respond to, to the more out there things from the original AdMech release. And they felt that that gave them a license to go a little bit further with these things. Well, they went too far, Paul. I don't think far. so, man. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually only like still going on about the flyer because it's become a bit of a, a bit of a joke now. It's a bit yeah, of a running theme. Uh, it's own. <laughs> yeah, everyone's talking to me about it. Message me like, ah, oh, so you're going to buy the flyer? What do you think about the flyer? Hey, how's that flyer going? Now you have to because the strategy know, is, is pretty, it's ex- pretty good. <laughs> This strategy was amazing. <laughs> and look, I'm sure the model is fantastic, but at this point, I'm committed. So well, it sucks. Often, you know, like things, we see these, we see these models, and then it, until we start posing them the way we want or painting them the way we want, then it's so true. Yeah, it looks a little bit different to us. But they they talk about how what what are they called? The riders, the Severus Calvary. The se- yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, they were based off of greyhounds, like dogs. Sick. So they, you know, they look kind of like horses to us, but the movements and the way that they coil themselves up and then move, and that's that's represented in in the three different types of like mount sculpts. Ah, uh, yeah, yep. Oh, so they, you mean that they they went to the dog races, had a couple of punts, and came back saying, "I think we're going to make some doggos." We're going to make those. Yeah, that's it. Because that that is yeah, they're all like on what they're all galloping or whatever you call it when a dog sprints, like it's running, <laughs> and they're all like on the right. Yeah, yeah, they're all sculpted. They look they look pretty perfect to me yeah it's going to be interesting to see how these fit into the army list i mean you know again we were talking about in previous things that it's going to be it's going to be tough to add things to the ad mech list but i I think that the there's now a strong case for that flyer getting put in there at least once i agree i think there's a strong case for a lot of this new stuff that i've, I've seen so far um it's either either sidestepping from existing stuff like as in the the flying dudes with the claw feet and the flechette blasters being a sidestep from infiltrators you can kind of whichever one fits better for how you want to play your game they essentially seem like they're doing similar things at the moment which could change of course we haven't seen the actual data sheets but um they're like similarly equipped similar strength and toughness and wounds and set etc uh one of them has fly one of them has infiltrate um, we'll see if you know they both come with deep strike or whatever. Yeah, it just seems like hey, you pick your flavor, see what works for you. And I think that's only a good thing. Like adding adding options, adding depth, adding adding nuance and little tactical choices through a range of models and different rules is what, what you like to feel. You like to feel a nice fleshed out force. I think this is exactly where Primaris Marines were upon release. They didn't. Nothing felt fleshed out about them. Like if you saw a pure like a straight out of the box Primaris Marine force at two thousand points, you were like. It doesn't kind of do much. Nice and everything it does, yeah, nice intercessors. Uh, and there's your two units of walking, walking hell blasters. I'm sure they're going to do very well for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I still haven't found Call. Very sad to say. Even sadder to see that the Mars trait seems to be the best. <laughs> yeah. The canicles would be hard to beat this Mars canical. Uh, yeah, that Mars canical is phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's so good. Oh, well, folks, that's our show for this week. Adam, thanks for joining me. Thanks to all our guests that that join in. I think I'm going to have at least one. I'll have more coming up over the next couple of weeks, just getting some community folks to give us their impressions of of what they're expecting, what their hopes and dreams for ninth edition are. There are so many hot takes to be done. Yeah, man. Well, Adam, have a great rest of your night. You too, mate. Take care. We'll see you. the truth.